Okay, so thanks for being here. And today I'm going to be talking about load balancing and specifically its applications towards networks in general. And I'm going to be focusing upon what load balancers are and how they are implemented. I'm mostly be going to focusing upon algorithm analysis, what algorithms are being used for load balancing, and then I'll be touching a bit upon uh, how what services are there in place to implement load balancing. So the idea for this came to me through one of the courses I was doing last semester, so last uh, year. So I was doing a course on system administration, and there I was learning about servers and networks and how what types of servers there are, how they are being configured. And one of the more, more obvious use cases of servers to me as a person new to this was about how they are going to manage load. So as a person who spent a lot of time on the internet, I always wanted to access whatever I could in the quickest time possible. So that's how I actually came about load balancing. And so that's the title of my talk right now. So a bit about myself, I am Shivan Mian, and I am a sophomore student at IIIT Delhi doing computer science and engineering. And I did my Google Summer of Code last year under the Loclac team. And I was also one of the guys behind the SUSE AI that you all have been seeing a lot of. So I kind of do a lot of stuff. I, I've been doing meddling around with AI, and this is obviously a DevOps talk. And I kind of end up working with whatever I find interesting. And you can contact me on that email. I know this is a bit hard to memorize, but my, that's my GitHub handle. And you can always look me up on Facebook. So, so what's it? What's the big deal? What is load balancing? So. It's pretty simple. So load balancing is a technique to distribute load optimally across servers. So <clears throat> that's as simple as it gets. So by optimal here, I mean you need to maintain the minimum response time for accessing the service. You need to get the maximum throughput. And you also need to reduce the overhead or the load on the servers. So that's how load balancing works. So as you can see, it's just a uh, traffic comes and load balancing, a load, a load balancer kind of acts as a middle person between the client and the servers. And it, depending on some algorithm and some obviously some parameters about the server, servers and the clients, it, auto, it, uh, it, re it routes the request to some one of the servers. So it, some of the servers. So basically. So why do we need load balancing? So the first reason we need load balancing is simplification. So it is a single point of entry to, for the client. Because th as I said, this acts as a middle person between the client and the server. So the client goes to the, when a client wants to access any website, so the website or the IP is actually going to is actually the one of the load balancer. And when he goes there, the load balancer routes it to one of the servers indirectly, uh, invisibly to him. And that's why it's like a single point of entry. And obviously, this, <coughs> this makes use of abstraction because of that. And this is scalable because you can involve as many servers you like, and you can have as many clients you want. You can even have distributed load balancers because so for bigger uh, systems, bigger companies, they use distributed load balancers. And reusability. So here there is so load balancers involve reusability of server IPs. This is a technique, this is called TCP multiplexing. So whenever a client wants to access something, so the load balancer maintains a a, a server pool of sorts. It maintains the IP addresses of all the all the servers, and whenever a client wants to access it, it just picks one, and then it allocates it to the client. And all of this can be reused. So that's what is reusability. Then it load balancers is one of the most important features. They are supposed to implement failover, which is when a server goes down, then the rest of it should be able to work perfectly. 
you should be able to balance load between the rest of the servers. So they mostly involve stuff like error reporting, logging, and yeah, it's it's obviously dynamic because why you can obviously one of the servers goes down, the load is bal balanced between all of the other servers, and if you want to add a new server, you can add it, and uh, it, the load will be uh, distributed between the other servers. So and responsiveness as i said so the one of the core features of load balancers is to minimize response time so and and distribute load efficiently so the response time obviously depends on the kind of algorithm you are using so it's pretty obvious so if you don't have a load balancer and if you're just sending uh, requests to one server or two servers you don't have a load balancer so you have a high chance of many requests being accumulated on one server itself and that's going to use up your uh, server's resources and obviously that's going to introduce some sort of lag so the algorithm here plays a big part in how the load is being distributed and this is and this is really important so <coughs> this slide is probably a bit misleading so adc isn't actually a consequence of load balancing it's actually the other way around so adc here means application delivery controller load balancers are actually implemented within application delivery controllers these days and what an adc is adc is a software or a device that does some common tasks that that for the web servers so that the load on them is reduced so a uh, very trivial example, suppose maybe you want to go to the admin page of some website, let's say Stack Overflow. So maybe you want to go to the stackoverflow.com slash admin.php. It exists, by the way. And, uh, what, and obviously, you need an anonymous user should not be able to access that, and only authenticated users should be. So what you can do instead is place the authentication within the load balancer instead of all of the servers so that the the load on them will obviously be reduced because it directly hits the load balancer uh, the adc and then it gets redirected back so an adc will implement a client to server to client flow because the client will send a request to the server and the adc actually has an additional capability it has the capability to modify or to modify the response that the client gets so and that in that reduces server loads and this adc is it involves load balancing they have load balancers built in and this is how uh, load balancers are implemented today so some services well hardware so there are hardware based and software based load balancers in the market so the in in hardware based i think f5 is one of the more uh, known names so they provide load balancers to microsoft actually and f5 is the one that actually came up with the term adc they they actually use it so and software based nginx nginx everybody's used it here and and it's pretty easy to use you just need a config file and just you add parameters and it just starts up and this another thing called balancing and that's actually open source so that's why it's here and there's netscaler which is by citrix and so on now let's get to the fun part this is going to be tasty because this i'm going to be talking about algorithms now so while i was doing my project i was actually reading about what are the what are the algorithms being used so I observed that many of these companies actually use really naive algorithms like round robin or least cons or random. Because random is pretty easy, right? And all of these are really trivial to implement. So what actually did strike me was, is there a better way to do something? And you can have many, many parameters. You can have a much larger load and maybe some other uh, parameters or features which are in the server that you may have not considered, which we may have to filter in. So that's what I'm going to be discussing, how efficient are these algorithms. So round robin is basically, uh, if you have k servers, then the ith request goes to the i mod kth server. I am using i mod k because the first request will go to the first server, 
the second will go to the second, and the k plus one request will go to the first. So it's basically i mod k. And least cons, basically, the load balancer will uh, route the request to the server with the least number of active connections. And random is random. Just This has like equal probability of any server hitting. So pros, obviously very simple to implement. Scalable, you can add any number of servers you like. And for random, this is this has like easy failover. Even if something goes down, like you can, it's anywhere random, right? So it can easily balance between the rest. And random also has like really less number of edge cases. So there is probably very less number of instances that a random can actually completely fail in. So for le for least connections, there are actually some really big edge cases, which is why it's not preferred. And for distributed load balancers, and it's the same approach. So in distributed load balancer, you have many load balancers, right? So if one load balancer implements random, the other one implements random. So the combination of them will obviously be random. So it's like the same approach. What's bad in this? So obviously, this is you are not filtering in request latency at this point. So it's not guaranteed that every request is going to is going to take the same amount of time. And it's not guaranteed that it, the server will react in the same amount of time. And least connections in RR have a lot of edge cases. So I'll give you an edge case. So suppose you have like n servers, and all of these n servers have something have load like hundred or maybe a thousand connections. And suppose you add one more server. Okay. So if you have something like least cons, so that server will obviously have no connection, so that will be a least connected thing. So as soon as you add that server, the load balancer will be like bam. And all the connections will be routed there. And because it's so much of load, a server will fail. So that's the edge case there. So and and obviously this is actually reducing the capacity of the usable space you have. So the reason that I'm going to be analyzing why this is actually going to be happening through one of the most simple and well-known problems in probability theory, which is the balls into bins problem. So the balls into bins problem is basically, given m balls and n bins, what is the maximum number of balls that can go into a bin for maximum likelihood? Because obviously, you can, have, you can randomly just put, you can have a chance that all the m balls go into one bin but that's like really not likely so what's in the maximum likelihood circumstance what is the maximum number of balls that can actually go into a bin so here obviously balls are your requests and bins are your servers so that's how we can actually analyze so the solution for the balls into bins problem was actually figured out in in this paper and the solution is actually quite nice and uh, i mean you can feast your eyes on this so basically this is like okay so i can't actually explain this much so with the case they have like four options of m and n and this was a paper by rab and steger and they actually found out a solution for the number of balls for the maximum number of balls that can go in so being the guy I am, I wouldn't actually, I didn't actually go much into the proof of it. I, I, I obviously wouldn't understand it that much. So, so well, let's go to some code. Let us consider we just have these n bins, and we have m balls. So here, I am just using n is the number of servers, m is the number of requests. I've just set them to some values, and then you have n servers, obviously. And I'm randomly like picking up indices, and then and then I'm just incrementing them by one. That is actually basically a request hitting one of the servers. And then what I'm doing, I'm just printing the server list, and then I'm printing the what's the maximum load a server has, the minimum, and the standard deviation. So this is what you get on a random run, just one run. So this is basically this, and you see the maximum load a server is getting is 139. And the minimum is 100. And the standard deviation is like 12. And you see, it's like, it's like there is like a 39 uh, request difference, which is 
actually quite a lot. You, it's like two extremes. One is actually a bit less, and the other one is like a lot. So what you actually want in load balancing, as I said, you need to reduce overhead. All of the all of the servers should actually have equal load because because in many cases you may have the same number of resources for the server. They might have the same memory, etc. So they should kind of all be balanced equally. And also, this is actually this has one limitation because I'm just incrementing by one. I'm just treating all requests to be equal, which is not the case because of, because obviously any, the request can take any amount of time. They 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 won't take the same amount of time, so they actually can't be treated as same. So we need to filter in something called latency into this because basically the response time. We need to we need to filter latency into this to model this better. So how do we model latency? So because yeah, how do we model latency? So so there are a couple of things done in this. So there's this guy, I think his name is Andrew, I don't know his surname, but anyway, so what he did was, this is basically a graph of uh, response times, and I think this is number of servers, I think, number of requests, and it's basically the response times he was getting, and this was approximating a Pareto and or a log normal distribution. So by the way, Pareto is also a log, a log distribution which is mapped to e to the power x or something like that. But we actually, most of us, we actually use log normal distribution to model latencies. And there are a couple of reasons for this. So one reason for this is basically entropy. So first is the principle of maximum entropy. It states that the distribution, the, the, the ideal distribution is actually the one which has the the least entropy or something. So log normal is actually the yellow line act thing. This actually fits in quite a lot, quite good. And also, we we tend to use logarithms for param this for parameters that are different, for that are independent. So this is basically a graph of he used more about five or more than five parameters. So because these parameters are independent, so just taking the log, you can just add them together. So that's why it's actually pretty nice to use. So that's one of the ways. So and that's why in entropy information, you can act, you, it's actually treated as the negative log. You actually use it. You actually use the log. So that's why we are actually using log normal here. There can be better ways to express this, possibly. And this was this paper by Ulrich and Miller. They actually used the log normal distribution and found out that it fitted really well to reaction times and so on. So what we are going to do is we are going to have a log normal distribution to model latencies. And um, since we actually don't have any of that right now, so what we are going to do is we are going to generate latencies. And then that's how we are going to model and we are going to generate them so that the mean is 1. They're all around one. So doing this again, so basically, since this is log normal, so I'll tell you the N and M remain the same. The capital M and capital S in a log normal distribution did, are basically the mean of the natural log of your random variable, which here is latency. And S is the standard deviation. So uh, and uh, in the paper here, in the paper here, they when they actually use that and they actually set the SD to like 0 0.15, I think they used SD as 0 0.15. I'm using 1.15. I'm just it's just a random thing. So then I'm just this M mean is what the how the mean of a log normal distribution is, and base latency is basically you can't have latency as zero. There can't be latency zero. You can't have response time as zero. So I'm just setting it to 0 0.05 is like 5 milliseconds. And then normalizing is basically scaling because I'm setting the mean to 1. I want all of them to be around the mean. So it's just basically scaling down. And then I'm just, that's, I'm just basically doing that. So, and what I'm adding is the normalized weight. And I'm then, I'm then doing the same thing. So what we get here is something like this. 
so this is actually really skewed so the once so the maximum is 160 the minimum is 185 and the sd is 21 which is actually a larger variation than what we saw before so this will actually be really skewed and kind of oscillating kind of stuff so basically there is actually no perfect way to map this so we had to there's actually no perfect way to balance load so there is actually another way to think of this you can have another algorithm for this maybe where you could use a greedy approach it's a greedy algorithm which actually works really well and this this algorithm which i'm going to describe out right now is i think the one that's being used today it's a really well known algorithm it's called the join the shortest queue algorithm so basically it is join we join to the server with least number of unfinished requests so it basically routes to the server which has the least number of unfinished requests it is similar to least connections and we use something like randomized joint shortest queue so randomized because uh, as i told you least connections has an edge case that if you have a lot of load on the other servers and a lot of requests are coming and if you are just one more server then it will that server is going to get a lot of load so which is not cool so randomized jsq is going to implement the fail failover capability and it's actually going to prevent that from happening so randomized jsq is actually really used so if i need to implement randomized jsq i just change like two lines so the earlier piece of code we had was we just took in this line uh, here the in the loop for weight and np random so basically we are choosing a random server and then we are just adding a normal and then we are just adding the normalized weight to it so in the JSQ, what we do is we just pick up two indices, two servers, and then we compare them. And the one with the smallest is the one we actually add to. So we just pick up, we just pick up two at a time. You can pick up any. So it's actually been found out that the twos powers of twos are actually better. So if you do it two at a time, then it's kind of good. But you can do it any. So. I basically pick two and then I compare them and I find out the one with the le least load and then I just add the weight to this. And this gives a really nice result. So the standard deviation has dropped to three and the maximum is 127 and the minimum is 114, which is like really close. And this is actually a really balanced kind of setup. So it's n it's not that this is this is the most efficient algorithm obviously there's a lot of there's a lot being done here so the, the, there are stuff coming up um, I mean, the, it's a really on field of research so but this is one of the more efficient algorithms and as i said there is actually no perfect algorithm to balance load which can probably filter in everything because there there is going to be some or the other uh, Sort of happening, which is going to prevent you from doing that. But yeah, J JSQ is actually like really efficient, and well, yeah. So, so to wrap it up, well, I've just uh, seen gone through all these algorithms, and well, it. I hope this uh, this is uh, it helps you build up some better algorithms. And I think making software load balancers is actually pretty simple. So. While I was working on my project, so I use Node.js, and there are actually like really helpful libraries out there. There's one called Cport, which actually implements the failover all by itself. It actually maintains the cluster, and once your cluster is there, the NL, the load balancing cluster is already maintained. Then all you need to figure, write the code for, is the algorithm. And round robin and least cons is actually pretty simple. You just need the list of the servers and then you can just uh, balance load in this so well i think that's it thanks a lot and any questions <laughs> thank you uh yeah anybody have a question about load balancing it's
um it's not necessarily related to what you were talking about you're talking about the algorithms with respect to load balancing so but the load balancing is obviously related to devops <coughs> okay so uh, my question is more along the lines of um the ba- load is being balanced with the load balancer what about high availability of the ba- load balancer itself so that's when you kind of high availability of so basically you're considering the case when the balancer goes down and what happens yeah so that's when you that's when you use load bal- that's when you use a distributed system obviously so that's when you use a distributed system you can't actually have one load balancer for all of the servers you have so the companies that you have they have so many servers you can't have one load balancer for that and besides obviously they they are obviously taking more measures to um, keep the load balancer active so they they are caching all its data and all of that so yeah it's the mostly implemented distributed kind of system you can't have one so any other questions okay okay thanks thank you make sure